great to be here with you all on the second best day of the year. Um, there's confetti and stuff all over here. My office is a mess. Uh, and it's because tomorrow's the best day of the year. I don't know if you guys knew it, if you felt it coming or not, but uh, it's, it's finally here. Uh, I love to like ironically celebrate my birthday. I really enjoy that. Um, one thing I started doing years ago, because um, I, I noticed this on social media, when your birthday rolls around and everybody sees it's your birthday, everybody says, like, you get, you get 100 messages of, happy birthday, Nate, uh, hope you have a great day. And so I decided I'm going to take control. <laughs> I'm going to take the bull by the horns, and I started offering out prompts for people. And I want to do that for you this morning. Uh, what would bless me more than anything, so th th this, is, this is me telling you what I want for my birthday. This is what, this is what it is. I would love it uh, if you could just drop me a note, an email, a text message. Um, just tell me something that you've experienced and tasted of the goodness of God in the last year. I hope it has nothing to do with me. It would bless me more. Just how have you experienced the goodness of God in the last year? That's the present you can give me for my birthday. Right, I would love that. Uh, let's go Lord in prayer as we enter into his word and look at Matthew 5 today. Father God, thank you for this good day. Thank you for um, just uh, the gathering of the Lord of your people. Um, there's nowhere I'd rather be. We're just thankful, Lord, to be able to uh, come and recognize you for who you are. Um, your name is great and it's worthy to be praised. Every good thing I have comes from you and I have never suffered injustice at your hand. Lord, in, in any pain and sorrow I've gone through, you've been there mourning with me. And anything I've had to celebrate, Lord, you, you've been there uh, with me, cheering me on. Lord, we ask that you'd be with us this morning, that you'd meet us right where we're at. I don't know what challenges each one of us is, is facing this week. I don't know everything we've been through. But I know, Lord, that you're with each one here. I know that you care about them. I know that you see them. Lord, we do think of our brothers and sisters this, this morning in Ukraine um, we, we pray for courage for them, uh, not just in military might, but that, that their hope and their trust this morning, at this moment, would not be in the weapon they hold in their hands, um, the government they claim allegiance to, but that it would be in you. Lord, that that, that 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 would be their testimony, that they stand unafraid because they know where their eternal destiny is. They know that they are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, we pray for, for, for those, uh, we hear, hear stories coming out of Russia of people, uh, Russian citizens standing in, in, in disbelief at what their own nation is doing right now. Lord, we ask that you would be speaking to them as, 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 as they feel out of control, as they don't know what to do, as, as some of them stand up and protest. We ask, Lord, that you would be made known through all of these things. And... We pray, Lord, that, that, that uh, just that you would speak powerfully through to both sides of this conflict. Um, and Lord, we, we, I want to lift up Lena and, and, and Victor as they have family back in Ukraine and, and our hearts go to them. As, I, can't, I can't imagine knowing people that are personally that are, that are standing in danger's path. Um, we just pray, Lord, for, for them and for their family and just all those, Lord, whose, whose lives have been uprooted Nothing is promised. Nothing is guaranteed. Um, I think, I know my whole life I have lived so far from danger, so far from conflict. But Lord, would, would we all recognize through this time of trial and, and, and struggle, Lord, that, that tomorrow is not promised us. You do not owe us that, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to make the most of the time that we have, knowing that, God, you will give us all the grace we need while there is breath in our lungs to trust in you. Give us that this morning and help us, Lord, to examine ourselves, examine our hearts on this communion Sunday, to consider the declaration that you make of us in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. In your name we pray. Amen. Emes este. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Hemes este, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, 
but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Last week, we discussed the Beatitudes that Jesus proclaims at the beginning of his first public address, the Sermon on the Mount, a sort of preamble to the rest of his message. Today, we're going to look at the next proclamation from Jesus, describing what his people are and what he expects us to be. This passage concerns salt and light, and it's about identity. A quick note uh, before we get into some more of that. Something quite unique here in this declaration of Jesus. Uh, So many passages throughout the New Testament are about how we as followers of Christ are being transformed. We're being sanctified. Um, Tell us that we're in process, right? God declares us righteous, Romans 5, 1, and we spend the rest of our lives uh, allowing the Spirit of God to work on us, convicting us of our sin, and indeed removing that sin from us, that we might look more and more each day like Christ our Redeemer. So many passages speak to this process. Philippians 1.6, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. Philippians 3.10 and 12, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. James 1.4, let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But what Jesus says here in Matthew 5, on the side of a mountain to his disciples is not about process. We see no mention of process here. He does not say, one day I hope you will aspire to finally be the salt of the earth. I hope one day you will finally look the way I want you to look. One day with my help, you could potentially, if you try hard enough, be the light of the world. That isn't the language used here. Jaimes este, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. What do you think of that? What do you think of that today? Are you comfortable with the thought of Jesus declaring that of you? A few weeks ago, I, I longer than that now, I, I did a little skit thing with the kids where I, I uh, told them about how I, I worked for Pepsi for seven years uh, back in the day. And uh, anytime somebody saw me, they didn't just see Nate Roche anymore. They saw the brand that I was representing. They saw Pepsi. I was a Pepsi man to them. And so then I, I pulled out a can of Coca-Cola and I opened it in front of the kids, which horrifies them, which is exactly what you want to see. Uh, that, is, that is what we are doing when we say that we are a Christian. You are a representation of what you are, what you are wearing, what you are claiming, that Bible you carry. You know, I I was Pepsi in the eyes of all who saw me wearing that uniform, and I am a little Christ, a Christian, as I live in this world. As a follower of Jesus, the question is not, am I the salt of the earth? Am I the light of the world? The question is, am I a good representation or not? Am I hiding my light or not? I can never forget my theology professor would always say, we are all theologians. We all have thoughts about God. That isn't the question. The question is, are we going to be a good theologian or a bad theologian? So in the same way, the question today is not, if I'm a follower of Christ, the question is not, am I salt? Am I light? It's, am I being a good representation as the salt or as the light? Jesus would later declare himself to be the light of the world. And he did so at an interesting time that's a little beyond the scope of what we have time for today. In John 8, chapter chapter 8, verse 12, it says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you know when he said that? Right after that encounter with that woman caught red-handed in adultery. Immediately after he frees her and redeems her and says, Go and sin no more. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 
So whatever we talk about today and the rest of our conversation surrounding salt and light, about being followers of Christ, know this. It ought to bring hope. It ought to bring hope. Let's talk first about salt. Some of you probably know more about salt in the, in the Roman world than I do, but to catch up the rest of us, uh, salt was very valuable um, because it had so, many, uh, so very many uses. It was, of course, used as a preservative at a time when there was no refrigeration. Uh, you could rub salt into meat and other, and other food products, and it would be preserved. Salt was very rare. It was not available to everyone, which is something very you know, strange to us because we have salt on every table and every diner and every kitchen in America, right? But to Christ's audience, it was very, very valuable. The city of Jericho was established uh, 10,000 years ago as a, as, as a salt trading center. And a lot of trade routes began where salt was and ended where salt was needed. Roman soldiers and sailors were often paid their salary in salt. We get our, our term uh, for salary from the Latin word sal, meaning salt. You've heard that phrase, not worth his salt. Well, that was coined because salt was used uh, as barter for slaves. If a man was lazy, was not, you would say he's not worth his salt. He's not worth what I paid for him. Or take it with a grain of salt. You've heard that expression. That came from the belief that, that salt in any amount was, you know, even one tiny grain of salt was an antidote for many poisons. So if you were going to consume a food and you weren't sure if it was safe, you'd take a little salt with it uh, and then not worry about it. Salt was also, as we all know, valuable as a flavor enhancer. But it's also important to the human diet. It was used as a fertilizer. There were so many uses for salt in the ancient world. And so uh, we can, we can, we can, I think we can assume that Jesus is not necessarily pointing to any specific application of salt, but is speaking here of a broad, inclusive sense to say that salt was essential. It was vital for everyday life. Pliny, the Roman author and philosopher, uh, lived in the first century AD, and, and so he's a good source for us to see what was important in that time. And he declared of salt, there is nothing more useful than salt and sunshine. So Jesus is saying in part here, when, he's, when he declares you to be the salt of the earth, he's saying in part, you are valuable. You are valuable. You are an essential part of what Jesus is doing on this earth. Well, valuable for what? If salt is a preservative, then what exactly is it that we are to preserve? I've heard it said that in the Evangelical Church of America, there's a battle currently taking place. And it's over what Jesus meant when he said that we are the salt of the earth. Did he mean that we are to preserve our comfort, our security, our way of life? Or did he mean to tell us that like salt affects everything that it touches, that we are to be loving and kind, that we are to make people think about God when they interact with us, that we flavor our world with the name and the hope of Christ. You are the salt of the earth. You are valuable to God, not because of some strange or special, special ability that you possess, but because we experience a transformation in our lives when we come into contact with the kingdom of heaven. Your presence as a son or daughter of God is necessary as God's means of influencing the world for good for him. I'm struck, uh, I didn't even think to mention this, which is funny to me. Um, verse 16. At the end of, at the end of 16, uh, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I want to mention this before I forget. Um, I've been in the St. Paul Cathedral in St. Paul, Minnesota. You've probably never been there before. It's, I love a big, glorious church. I love going into a space where my eyes go up, where I, and, and, and it's just glorious, and it's something of heaven is there, just the, the sense of scale. There's columns there, almost as big as this building. It's just massive. At the back of, the, of St. Paul Cathedral, on the back left, if you ever get a chance to visit, is Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. But they put the period, I, I never took a picture of it, and I wish I would have, because I'd love to put it up on the screen for you. They put the period in a funny spot in the Catholic Church. It says, in the, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, 
Period. Period. We know the rest of the verse. That it, that you, that it may glorify your Father who is in heaven. What are we trying to preserve? What are we trying to shine light on? What are we here for? To make ourselves look good? Or so that others see God when, when they're in our presence? That we point others to him? We are the salt of the earth. We are, we are valuable to God. Influencing the world for good and for him. We get this wonderful message, you are the salt of the earth, but with it comes a warning. Immediately after, both, both salt and light, we immediately get this warning afterwards. As if to say, be salt in the world, sprinkled where you are, be a blessing, remind people of God, work for good, all of this in the world, out there, not, not just in the walls of this church. But be careful. But be careful. You'll lose your saltiness. If, you don't, if you're not careful. Be friends with sinners, but, but watch out. Make sure you don't fall back into sin yourself. And while there is certainly danger of being in the world, it is our purpose, our calling, and the desire of God to live in such a world. David Kinneman is the president of the Barna Group, and he wrote this, that being salt and light demands two things. We practice purity in the midst of a fallen world, and yet we live in proximity to that world. If we do not hold up both truths and tension, we invariably become useless and separated from the world that God loves. You, the salt of the earth, must find yourself in the world. You must. It is dangerous. It is inhospitable. It is not your home. But it is where you find yourself. And you have been sprinkled where you are by God. The church is only the church when it exists among people. Otherwise, it's just a display piece, like a muscle car sitting in a museum. Is that not the saddest thing? Or a beautiful doll that just, it's never taken out of the box that it comes in. That car is meant to be driven. That doll is meant to be played with. The church is meant to move outward. It is meant to shine in the darkness, and that is messy. The proof of your identity as a child of God is found in the nature of your life. If you are a believer, you will look like Christ. You will. Read 1 John. You will. You will, you will look like Christ. You will preserve God's truth. And like Christ, you will be found in this world. It is God's design and desire for you. He did not create us to be ascetics. He did not create us to run and hide. It was Jesus who went to the leper colonies. It was Jesus who ate with, with, with the worst of the worst sinners. That's where Jesus went. That's who he was. And he calls us to the same. So here's a question for you before we move on to the light. What are you concerned with preserving? What are you here to do? The truth is that at times I, I can be as guilty as anyone. I can be focused on preserving some of the wrong things. My image, my church, preserving position or power, we often attempt to preserve things just the way they are. What are we preserving today? Because this is Jesus' plan to use people like you and me to bring the kingdom of heaven to places like this, canyons like this, to be the salt where we've been sprinkled. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people put light on a, people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The pattern remains the same in this second analogy from Jesus. Christ declares you, specifically, emphatically, you are the light of the world. He then immediately warns of the dangers of not living as the light. He immediately speaks to putting it under a basket. Why does he do this? Why does Jesus warn us about things like this? Maybe he knows our weaknesses. Specific to the Lord of light, to the light of the Lord. In John 3, verses 19 through 21, it says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone, everyone who does evil hates the light 
and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth that comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Everyone who does evil hates the light. I've got some bad news for you, church. It's also the best news. Light reveals. Light reveals. That's what light does. It's helpful when you're working on a car engine or in my case, when I'm watching my father-in-law work on my car engine. Uh, light is helpful in that situation, right? And, and when you're walking on a, on a dark path, Light's obviously important. I'm I'm sure many of you know that song taken from Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We love that aspect of light. It shows us dangers. God's word does that. God warns us of dangers that we may not see. I, I firmly believe every command, every law, everything God tells us to do or to abstain from in here, it's just like a good father telling his kids not to play in the street. It's as simple as that. God sees dangers we do not see. Here's the tough part. Light also reveals what we'd rather keep hidden. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Robert Murray McChain says that the nearer you take anything to the light, the darker its spots will appear. And the nearer you live to God, the more you will see your own utter vileness. And where the church, and, and this is the piece that breaks my heart, and this is the piece that I'm sure many of you have experienced, and this is the piece that keeps people out of this building and buildings like it. Where the church should be the one, should be the place, opening the blinds and letting the sun pour into our lives, into our communities and into our relationships, sometimes this is the place where we pull the shades even tighter. And we put on a smile. And the bigger the sin, the more we cover it up. And so unwittingly, our homes and our churches can become, rather than places of light and openness and honesty and forgiveness and healing, This should be the safest place for your sin. This should be the safest place for your sin. Instead, it can be a place where the dark corners are never exposed, never open to the light of day. Because our sin is true about us. I think that's the most difficult thing about our sin. The accuser of our souls can look at it and say, Nate, you did that. I did. I did. And I'm guilty of it. I think it's one of, the, one of the more difficult things we can over, that it takes us to overcome this issue, if you can identify with not wanting to let light into your life, is that we often uh, point elsewhere to the problems of our world. John Stott said, and if you hear nothing else today, hear this, we should not ask what is wrong with the world. We should not ask what is wrong with the world. For that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask, what has happened to salt and light. My first summer after seminary, I went back home and I worked for three weeks at the summer camp that I'd I'd been directing. And I I met a guy who I'd known, I'd worked with his kids, I'd known him for probably 10 years. And and we had a conversation and it was the same conversation that I'd been having with this gentleman for 10 years. For 10 years, he'd been telling me about all the problems in the world. Everything wrong, all the governmental stuff, all the politics, all the... Everything, everything wrong with our world. And I, I looked at him after a year of seminary. I don't know why I didn't say it earlier, but I looked at him and I said, yeah, you're, you're right about all that stuff. You're right, it's bad. It is, it's ugly. What are we going to do about it? What's the solution? The diagnosis has already been given for the world. It, it's, it's all through here. No one, there's no one who does good, not even one. We're bad. We're messed up. Apart from God, we are hopeless. The world out there doesn't know the Lord of love. They don't know him. And yet sometimes I still expect them to live Christianly. To act in a way that I think would be proper. The question is not what is wrong with the world. That diagnosis has already been given. Instead, we ought to ask, what has happened to salt and light? I'm sick of just talking about problems out there. I'm sick of talking about problems up there. The diagnosis is given. 
Our world doesn't know God. It has rejected Him. I need to stop pretending like they're going to act the way that I'd like them to act. They don't know the Lord of love. They don't know Him. Instead, we ask and we pray, God, help us. The people that you said are salt and light, help us, God. What has happened to us? Why are we not living as you want us to live? So what do we do with all this? Christ declares us to be salt and light in the world, and yet we we wrestle against it. Many of us doubt our ability, our qualifications, to ever live up to Christ's expectations. When Paul would write in Ephesians 5, verses 6 to 14, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk therefore as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. That's what light does. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed to light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Note that this passage does not say become perfect and then step into the light of the Lord. Once you are prepared, once you feel ready, open the curtain and then let the light come in. Once, once, you've, had a t- once you've had a chance to hide all of your boxes in the corner, then open the shades. Or once you feel perfect and ready and the house is spotless, then open the shades. No. The difference between children of light and children of darkness is not that one group sins and the other doesn't. That's not the difference. The difference is that children of light are willing to let their sins be exposed to the light. They're honest about their struggles. This is vitally important because your vulnerability, your honesty about the garbage you've been through in this life is the fuel that burns the light for others to see. We ought to live a life of, of, where, where our witness, our testimony is, come and let me show you what God has done for me. Growing up, I saw my father's anger time and time again. Um, and one thing that I noticed about the anger in my father uh, that's not pretty, that's not good, is, is that it worked. Anger works. It does. It gets what it wants. And so I, I saw this anger grow in me. I saw it develop. I, I nourished it. I was... And I saw it work for me. I got what I wanted as a young man. I also saw God come into my life at the age of 17. And I saw almost like a claw machine. God just kind of come down and pluck that anger out of my life. I'm happy to tell you about it. Because I didn't get rid of it. I can promise you that. Anger worked for me. I just saw God do something, and and that is the light that people need to see. Come and let me show you what God has done for me. While it's often unhelpful to express to others how amazing we are, it's incredibly helpful for others to see how God has amazingly saved us. Being salt and light requires honesty and openness, vulnerability. The light must come into our life even if, if we ever hope to shine in this world. Christ is calling us to something more than what we hide in the darkness, to something more than keeping the blinds pulled on our lives, something more than covering our light with a basket or being flavorless and trampled underfoot. He believes that you are the salt and light of the world. The battle is for us to believe it too, to trust him enough to live in the light, to be children of that light. Let's close in prayer as we prepare for communion. Father God, thank you. Um, what you. What you speak of us, what you declare us to be is something I, I, I don't know a person alive that feels qualified for. But the point, Lord God, is that we might be people that, that, when, that when others see us, others that, that at, at this moment may not believe in you, may not like you, may, may, may have been hurt or burned by Christianity, we ask, Lord, that, that, 
That when other people see us, we would be willing to share with them what you have done for us. That we would tell them, Lord, of of the sin that you've plucked out of our lives, of the things that you've done, how you've softened our hearts, how you've made us more compassionate, how we have been forgiven by you, and so now we are convicted, we are compelled to be more forgiving. Let our lives, like, there, there are so many things in life right now that can be argued. It is difficult to argue with a good testimony. Help us not to be afraid to share ours, to tell the world of what you've done, We ask so that you would help us now as we prepare for communion that this might be a place and a space where honest things can be said. Where we can can openly admit to the things that the accuser of our souls is, is telling us about ourselves. We are angry that we are broken, that we have done things we regret, but Lord, we can leave them here. Help us, Lord, to be able to do that openly and honestly, to confess these things to you. As we before we partake in communion together. In your name we pray. Amen.